it's, it's a difficult question to answer whether there's any future for Eater. Um, there is a future in the sense that it's definitely under construction and it's a very big hole in the south of France at the moment um, and there's a lot of work going on there. And I think there's a future in the sense that I suspect the reactor will get built. Um, I think that there's enough of a commitment from the seven members involved that they're actually going to put it together. Um, it should work, uh, but you have to remember that it's probably the most complicated scientific experiment ever built, and there's a lot of technology that will need to work to make it happen. Now, even if ITER does work, I guess the question is, is there a future for fusion? And to me at least, that seems like a much more complex question. The basic science of fusion is that in conventional nuclear power you have fission, you have a uranium atom and a little nucleus or a little neutron comes in and splits it apart and that releases energy. In fusion you have two very light atoms and they come together and they, they create um, a heavier atom and that creates energy as well. Um, in the case of ITER it's uh, isotopes of hydrogen that are actually doing the fusing, so it is deuterium and tritium, which is hydrogen with one and two extra neutrons respectively. The advantages of it is that per unit mass you get a lot more energy out and you don't have long-lived uh, radioactive byproducts from fusion power, um, but the disadvantages is just a lot harder to do. Obviously, uh, like magnets, uh, you know, two positively charged nuclei repel each other, and so overcoming that repulsion is very, very difficult. And that's really what's been plaguing the fusion community for the past 50 years or so. Eater, Eater has been dogged by delays almost since the day it was uh, conceived, which is really reflects the rest of fusion power. Uh, fusion has always been a field of big dreams um, and difficult technical realities. Um, in the case of ITER, uh, what you have is a, a giant machine, really. I mean, far larger than, than any sort of conventional nuclear experimental reactor would have to be. And, and it's a very complex machine. It involves superconducting technology, it involves radiation-hardened materials, advanced robotics that can move things around inside uh, during the, the periods when it is highly radioactive. And all this stuff has to come together and work, and it's being built by seven different partners uh, basically all around the world. So it's, it's a very complex project and not surprisingly, it's over budget and behind schedule. Nevertheless, um, assuming it continues on track, uh, it will eventually achieve fusion energy in the sense that it will produce more power than it consumes. And that'll be a big milestone when it happens. Now, there are a lot of alternatives out there, um, and there are people who lobby very hard for them. Just recently in Britain, we've had a lot of uh, interest in certain corners with uh, the idea of getting power from thorium um, using a sort of liquid salt reactor, I think it is. Uh, the problem with alternatives to nuclear power is that conventional nuclear power has a track record, and when you talk about commercial production of power and the people who invest money in this sort of thing. They want to know something works. They don't want to spend a lot of money on R&D. And so I think it will be a very long time, if ever, before we see uh, you know, an alternative to conventional nuclear power. I think that for the most part, um, People who are, you know, for nuclear power have remained for nuclear power um, post Fukushima. And people who are against it have remained against it. I guess the big difference I've seen is just a heightened awareness of the dangers that nuclear power poses, of the of the possibility of a meltdown, which, you know, people had sort of receded in people's memory. It had been 25 years since Chernobyl. Chernobyl was an old reactor design anyway, and so I think people had sort of forgotten that this sort of thing could happen. Um, and I guess what I think Fukushima does is it reminds everyone that accidents will happen and of the real economic costs, and I think that's where the real problem with Fukushima is. It's not 
the threat that it posed to human health, as far as we can tell, very few people were made sick, if anyone, uh, from the accident. Even the workers uh, seem to have escaped relatively uh, with low doses. The real problem is that um, there's been an enormous economic disruption to the Fukushima region. There's people who will remain displaced for decades as a result of the accident. And I think those economic consequences will really make maybe not normal everyday people rethink nuclear power, but the people who will finance nuclear power, the people who will want nuclear plants, uh, you know, utility companies, they're going to think twice about it. And I, I think it probably will delay nuclear in the long term. The problem that I've really come to understand with the Fukushima accident is that nuclear technology is complex um, and that really even with the proper resources and even with a bachelor's in physics, which is the degree I hold, you can really challenge you when you're in a, a difficult situation and you're trying to understand what's happening, um, say in an accident scenario. Um, I think, you know, you just take radiation, for example, you know, you've got three kinds of radiation, which are actually three very different nuclear processes, um, each of which has three very different health consequences that all depend on how you receive the dose and where it came from. And I think, you know, this was one of the most pressing questions following Fukushima, and there were no straight answers for anyone, even with the the sievert system, um, which is supposedly going to give you a straight sort of this is how much radiation you've got and how much radioactivity you may have, uh, you know, ingested or been exposed to. Um, there was just no way to really say to people, well, here are the consequences. Um, and that was something that I think was a real, a real weakness in the system that I, I saw as a result of the accident. In terms of sort of nuclear technology more broadly, I do think that people generally grasp that um, nuclear, you know, doesn't release greenhouse gases and has certain advantages. Um, you know, I think the question is, do people really want to learn about it? Pe most people don't care where their electricity comes from, and so even if you have the resources, that doesn't mean that people are going to, to, to use them until there's an accident or something big that happens. I mean, in the case of Germany, certainly, there was a strong public outcry and Germany closed all its nuclear reactors. I, I believe Switzerland's doing the same thing, actually. Um, in the case of France, they left the reactors open. I, the thing about France, of course, and many other countries, is that they're heavily reliant on nuclear power for um, their energy. And they don't really have an option. You can't just shut down all your nuclear reactors. I mean, we've seen the consequences in Japan. Um, so I think people sort of, you know, to a certain extent, the governments who have, have committed to nuclear heavily don't have a choice about it, um, and they just have to uh, carry on as best they can. I think, you know, should there be a broader public debate about nuclear? Probably. Um, it, we see this especially with the nuclear waste problem, um, you know, the, the fact that no one can get a nuclear waste repository built uh, is reflective of the fact that people don't really you know, understand nuclear power, they have a lot of fear of radiation, and they haven't really had the option to make these decisions on their own. I definitely think that scientists and uh, nuclear engineers get a lot of, um, a lot of input. In fact, perhaps too much input into the decision-making process. And I don't mean that because they, they shouldn't have input. In fact, scientists need to have a major role in determining a lot of different aspects about how nuclear power is used and how it's built. Um, but the real, the real issue is that often the policymakers don't really understand nuclear power. And I think the, the problem there is that as we saw with Fukushima, when there's an accident and decisions need to be made, made quickly, um, you can have a situation where the technical team knows certain things and they have difficulty communicating it to, to the policymakers. Um, I guess if, if, if there was one thing I could say about sort of the role of scientists and engineers, it's that they really need to have, um, you know, maybe even a tighter linkage with the leadership and maybe they need to be a little better about explaining their knowledge because often they end up just trying to, to make decisions as best they can 
um, in, in an emergency situation or something like that. I think, I, I think it's a real open question how uh, nuclear power will move forward in the future. Um, the plants are nearing the end of their lifetimes and really the question is are people going to build new nuclear or are they going to build something else? At the moment the, the capital cost of building a nuclear plant in a western country like the UK or America is so high that people actually don't want to do it. They just see it as too much of a risk. And when I say people, I mean the, the actual cap venture capital who would be financing these plants. Um, and so there is a, a real question as to whether nuclear is going to continue to be as strong a part of the energy mix as it is right now. Um, I think, you know, the alternatives are kind of equally bad in certain ways. I mean, if we don't have nuclear, we got to get energy from somewhere, and that somewhere is going to be coal natural gas, um, and without carbon capture technology, uh, these will pose significant environmental uh, challenges, really. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it really remains unclear uh, how nuclear will proceed in the West, but it's also important to remember that in the developing world, in China and India and Brazil in particular, um, there's a very active interest in nuclear power, and there's a lot of new build uh, being done. And what we may end up seeing, I suppose, is um, some of that expertise and technology is coming back into the West and maybe providing nuclear uh, plants at a lower, a lower cost. The concern with renewables, of course, is this whole issue of baseload power and the fact that at the moment renewables cannot provide, um, you know, the sort of levels of electricity consistently in the way that conventional power plants can. And I think that the question will be whether or not renewables can, can sort of rise to meet that challenge and begin to provide large amounts of electricity you know, in a sort of fashion that allows it to be used efficiently. Um, there's a lot of technical hurdles to that, uh, but when you look at a project like ITER, or you look at the barriers to new nuclear plants, I'm not necessarily sure that the barriers to renewable energy use are any higher than the barriers to, to nuclear power. I'm Jeff Brumfield, and I'm a reporter here at Nature.